Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the tool training of EEQ part two. My name is Wael Haddad and I'm a postdoctoral researcher um, at the Neary Sim Center. I'm actually based at uh, University of California, Berkeley. And uh, today we'll, uh, we're gonna go through the second part of the tool training for EEQ. So this is the outline of uh, my presentation today. Uh, we're gonna do a quick recap of part one. Uh, um, that was yesterday we're going to cover the competition framework for eeq how eeq actually works and we'll also talk a little bit about the role of the design safe cyber infrastructure and the resources that uh, they uh, allow researchers to access um, i'm going to focus mostly today on the ground motions and characterizing ground motions using eeq uh, we're going to talk about the stochastic models that are available in EEUQ, the record selection and scaling features. We will briefly go over site response, although this is going to be covered in more detail in part three. Um, and then we'll also cover other methods that might be of interest to uh, researchers who want to provide like custom methods to uh, uh, characterize ground motions and want to add it into EEUQ. Um, after we talk about the ground motion uh, motions features in EEQ, we're going to do some demos. So um, I'm planning to do a demo to run, run kind of a larger scale simulation using the design safe cyber infrastructure resources. Um, we're also going to demo some local uh, simulations using both the stochastic time history generation and also uh, using record selection either uh, by using a design spectrum as a target or a uniform hazard spectrum. And we're going to talk about, you know, USGS web services and how we're taking advantage of that as well. <clears throat> so uh, just uh, a recap of part one. So the Neary Sim Center um, is actually a, a research center funded by uh, the National Science Foundation. And uh, we are uh, focused on developing computational and simulation tools. Uh, we develop open source and extensible tools for researchers in the natural hazards engineering. And um, Frank has talked about this yesterday and gave an introduction and kind of an overview of how this uh, is being developed. Uh, but just as a recap, uh, uh, I mean, one pattern that you guys might see very often with many of our tools, not just EEQ, is this pattern you see on the right hand side here is there is an existing software and we kind of try to um, create a wrapper around it to make it look like a puzzle piece and this helps us uh, fit it into a workflow that consists of many puzzle pieces together uh, so just to give you an example for OpenSeas for instance this software can be OpenSeas so we create a preprocessor and postprocessor for OpenSeas um, for Dakota we do the same thing uh, sometimes we need to use external data and uh, like for instance when we are doing record selection we want to get some of this data from publicly available databases like the peer ground motion database so we develop clients we develop wrappers we develop tools to kind of integrate the existing tools together for the most part and that's actually what most of our tools are doing that's what eeq does so what eeq actually does it tries to combine the earthquake engineering models, for instance, using open seas with uncertainty quantification and optimization tools that are available in Dakota. And in addition to that, it brings in external data, uh, it interfaces with databases uh, or web services like the peer ground motion database or like the USGS web services, for instance. So this is just kind of a big picture of what we do and what in particular EEQ does. So yesterday, Frank maybe have uh, mentioned the uh, user forum. I just wanted to make sure that uh, you guys also know where to post uh, if you have any feature requests or if you have difficulty with some of the exercise today or if you have any questions in general, we highly recommend that you join the user forum. The link is there, it's available in the slides and uh, there is a, um, dedicated thread for earthquake engineering for the eeq tool um, and uh, we really value your feedback so if you have any feedback uh, you know feature requests bug uh, reports and uh, all of these things if you want to add features to eq that would be very helpful 
Um, just a very quick review of the user interfaces. This actually applies to most of our tools. Most of the tools developed uh, by the Sim Center have this interface where um, you have a, a, an um, input panel selection on the left where you can select from um, different modes. Um, and on the right, you have this input panel where you specify the inputs. And Frank has went over the UI for uh, AEUQ yesterday, and he probably went through many of these steps. So what to do with uncertainty quantification, what to do with the simulation, the finite element model, and the EDPs, and how to specify random variables, and how to view the results. So he went over most of these, and he also talked about the events, but today I'm gonna focus mostly on the event and basically try to go through all the different features that we have to specify the event. In that case, the event is basically an earthquake. So we're trying to characterize the ground motion and we have different ways and different models that allow uh, researchers to specify how ground motions um, um, are applied on a building model. Uh, but this is the general uh, user interface. So uh, uh, at the top here, there's a message area where you see some notifications. There is a login button if you're gonna run jobs remotely. And at the bottom here, there is a uh, push buttons that you can use to run either locally or run remotely uh, on high performance computer and also to get the results from there. Uh, this is a quick recap of the user interface. And what you see here on the screen is basically what our record selection uh, uh, input panel basically you you're doing record selection in that particular case we are trying to use the design spectrum from ASCE 7 and we select records from the peer ground motion database to match that spectrum but we're going to talk about this into more detail this is this is just a quick recap of uh, part one um, as uh, Matt has mentioned we do have a, an installation guide. Uh, a, uh, we also have a new version of EUQ available to download now um, if, if you want to get the latest one with all the latest features. So I put uh, this slide uh, just as a recap with all the links that you might need. It's in the PDF for the presentation. So if you need any of these links, it, it should be there. So there are links to installation, instructions for Windows and Mac, uh, links to download the documentation, the message board, and also to download the examples. Um, so the, as we mentioned, Sim Center is actually part of the NERI, which is the Natural Hazard Engineering Research Infrastructure. It's a, uh, a facility funded by uh, NSF, and NERI actually funds many uh, different uh, research sites. Um, you can see most of these sites here on the screen. And what you will notice is that the majority of these sites are actually uh, experimental facilities. Um, there is only two exceptions to that. There is the Cyber Infrastructure Project, which is what we call Design Safe CI. It's based in University of Texas, Austin. And there is the Sim Center, which is based at UC Berkeley. So these are the two uh, uh, funded uh, projects as part of NERI that are not actually experimental. Um, so I'm going to talk about these two facilities in particular a little bit. Uh, uh, so we, we actually like to think of the Sim Center and possibly Design Safe 2 as kind of a, a virtual experimental facility. So we kind of experiment, but instead of doing real experiment, we're experimenting with software kind of. Um, so the Sim Center actually develops this research software research tools uh, like you know cofam that you guys have seen and eq which we're covering today and there are other tools like ppe for performance based engineering and there is a tool for wind engineering tool uh, too and all of these research tools they are um, actually they have emphasis on uncertainty quantification so part of the job of the sim center is to develop these tools to allow researchers to do uncertainty quantification for natural hazards engineering and these tools are cloud enabled, uh, meaning that they give you access to actually a lot of resources uh, by interfacing with DesignSafe. DesignSafe actually provides kind of uh, the data storage, the access to high performance computer. So we have access to Stampede 2 supercomputer and we'll talk a little bit about this today. And the Sim Center deploys 
the computational framework inside design safe uh, uh, resources and we develop all these front ends like eeq to allow you to access these resources and run really large scale simulations so we're going to talk today about um, how this is uh, useful and how to actually run large scale simulation on hpc using some of the same sensor tools uh, but this is what i wanted to emphasize is all of these tools as you guys can see they do uncertainty quantification and they are scalable to run an HPC and uh, the interface with design safe. So we're going to talk about this into a little bit more detail. Regarding our computation framework, I mean, you guys might have seen this in the previous presentation, but basically we, we like to think of this computation framework as if we are connecting puzzle pieces. We want to have different ways of describing the building, different ways of describing the hazard, doing the modeling and response estimation and also doing uncertainty quantification and also bringing data from databases if we need to. And this is our computation framework which we use for most of our tools. For EEUQ today, I mean, I think EEUQ basically uh, covers most of these except for the loss estimation and regional recovery simulation. So EEQ allow you to describe the building, to describe the hazard, to do the modeling and estimate the response. It also allows you to bring data from supporting databases and to do uncertainty quantification. And, uh, and, and this is basically how this computation framework works. And as I mentioned, the nice thing about this is that you can run this locally on your local computer if you're running a smaller model, a small scale simulation. But if you want to run a large model, you want to do you know, a very large scale simulation, then, then definitely you can run it on the cloud using design safe cyber infrastructure. And the nice thing is that once you sign up to Design Safe, you, you actually get access to some of these really valuable uh, computational resources uh, just by signing uh, up. So now we, we've done like kind of a recap of part one. So I'm gonna go uh, over the different ways of characterizing ground motions in EEUQ. Uh, the first thing I want to uh, talk about is the ground motion uh, record selection and scaling. And this is actually a tool we have in EUQ. It tries to integrate existing tools. It actually tries to integrate USGS web services with the peer ground motion database. Um, so from the USGS web services, you can actually get some information about the hazard itself, about the, I would say the kind of the response spectrum. So you can obtain from these web services a design spectrum like the ACE7 spectrum or AC41 or even the IBC, um, and then you can uh, even uh, obtain a uniform hazard spectrum for different regions in the US. And we try to take this uh, uh, spectrum uh, uh, and then use it as a target for record selection. And we do record se selection by using the ground motion records available in the peer ground motion database. So what you see here on the right hand side, for instance, this blue line, kind of a straight line. This one is the ACE7 design spectrum. And we use that as a target. And then the um, gray uh, lines are uh, the spectra from a suite of ground motions that we selected and scaled from the peer ground motion database. Uh, so basically EEQ have tools to automate this process for you. So it's, it's as easy as clicking few buttons and you have a suite of ground motions that you can apply in your model which allows you to design your model and also kind of characterize the uncertainty because you have a suite of ground motions. So you get some measures of uncertainty um, on the response. And this is basically how it works. It's as uh, simple as that. We access the USGS web services, we do record selection and scaling, and we have a client that goes to the peer ground motion database and download the records for you. Um, so in terms of the user interface, it's uh, relatively simple, although it looks like it's very busy, but it's as simple as specifying the target, which can be either a design spectrum or it comes from seismic hazard analysis. Then you perform the record selection and scaling. You can select how many records you want into the, the suite and um, you can filter by magnitude or distance or VS30. And, and then you can compare uh, the records the selected records to the target that you have specified using this plot on the right hand side and you can also inspect all the records that were selected the scale factors their magnitudes and so on 
and then you can also choose how they are going to be applied on uh, the building model because in most of the peer uh, ground motion records they have three components so you can either choose to apply one component horizontally or two horizontal components or even three if you want to include the vertical components um, so that's for record selection and scaling and we'll cover this you know extensively uh, during the demos with some examples and also the exercise now the next thing on the list uh, for characterizing ground motions is the um, stochastic load generations and before i talk about this feature in euq i actually want to talk about a library that was developed at the same center this library is called smelt and it's a very well written library actually it's a, it's a very modular it's very extensible and it's written in c plus plus and it can be used to uh, do stochastic time history generation and it actually have application in different uh, for different natural hazards uh, right now it has two stochastic models for earthquakes uh, one is called Palacios et al. It's from 2018, and the other one is Tabagi and Der Kriegen. Um, so these are two models for generating earthquake time histories uh, using a stochastic model. And we'll talk about this in details and also in the demos. Uh, but SMELT supports these two models for uh, earthquake uh, ground motion uh, time history generation. It also have another model for uh, generating wind loads. But of course, we will not cover this today but it might be covered uh, later for the WEEQ training. Now, the, the one thing I want to point out here is that this library is actually extensible, so other models can be added. So if you're interested, you, you please, I mean, feel free to check the source code, the documentation, and also feel free to contact us if you're interested in adding more models into this library, or if you want to request more models to be added. So inside EEUQ, this library SMELT is being used uh, to provide two models. As I mentioned, there are two models, Balachos et al. This is a relatively simpler model uh, that you can use. You, it has fewer parameters and it kind of generates um, uh, time histories for an earthquake scenario. So you provide the magnitude of the earthquake, the distance to rupture and the uh, average shear wave velocity and uh, and that's that's it these are the three parameters you need to provide and it will actually generate like um, different realizations of the ground motion for you the other one that is um, a little bit more involved uh, it's the baggy and the Kriegen. this one is actually uh, it takes uh, directivity into account so it is i think more suitable for near for ground motions and it is more involved when it comes to parameters, so you have to specify more information about the uh, rupture geometry and relative to the location of the site. Uh, so it has more parameters, and these parameters are defined into this figure. It's also available in the user interface, but it can also provide you uh, uh, stochastically generated realizations of the ground motions, which you can apply on the model in EEUQ. <clears throat> One of the other ways to specify ground motions in EEQ is the site response analysis. And as I mentioned, uh, I mean, this is actually is also available as a standalone tool. We call it Shark, and it's gonna be covered into a great details tomorrow. Most of the day, most of the part three of this training is actually dedicated to Shark, to the site response analysis. But today we're just gonna go over it very quickly, all that, uh, I want to cover today is just uh, the bigger picture. So this is a tool that allows you to define different layers of the soil, specify their properties and propagate ground motions from the bottom of the soil column up to the level of the building. So you can do that inside EEQ and then you get ground motions that you apply to on the building model. Now, in addition to these uh, three different methods that we mentioned, there are two other methods. One we call the multiple peer events and what this does is it allows you to select existing peer records that you have on your computer and use them as a, a suite of ground motions and it allows you to apply these records to different degrees of freedom or specify different scale factors if you want and i want to point out i mean you might ask i mean we've already shown like another way of getting peer ground motions why would we need to use this one i mean one use case for instance is if you don't want to use the record selection methods that we provide, uh, 
uh, let's say you have a newer method, uh, you're do doing uh, research about record selection and scaling and you're implementing a different logic to do record selection. So you, ha you already have a way of coming up with a suite of records of scale factors and so on. And you want to do something different from what we do. In this case, this might be the right tool for you. And all that it does is just, you give it um, a list of files that you have with peer ground motion records and their, um, their scale factors and, and, and it, it applies this on the model. Another tool that we have, we call it the multiple existing events. It's basically allow you to define the ground motions in um, text file format. It's called the JSON format. It's a very readable text format and you guys can see it here. This actually defines the event. Its name is El Centro. It's a seismic loading BT 0.02. So it's very readable. As you're reading this file, you understand what's going on, the number of steps and so on. And then the time series, you see the data here for the time series. And uh, just how this is applied on the model. So the degree of freedom is specified here under pattern. So this is kind of a very, very generic way of specifying um, ground motions on uh, earthquake engineering model. And this, again, the use case for this is if you have a completely different way of generating this time history and you just want a very generic way to specify the ground motion, this is the right tool for you. So, I mean, we try not to lock uh, researchers into using a particular tool. If you, you know, let's say you're developing a new stochastic model and you want to apply it on building models. So now you have your own code and it generates this time history. So you can simply generate this JSON file and use it here as an input. So just some of these use cases where you're trying to do something, you want to customize something, you want to generate inputs in a different way. This is also possible in Unity. So I'm gonna do the demos in a little bit, but before I start doing this, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about design safe again. Um, because we, we will try today to also run some uh, remote jobs like some jobs on design safe with a large number of samples and see how this goes. Um, so I'm hoping that you guys can will be able to do that also during the exercise. So design safe again it's uh, one of the newly funded projects it's the cyber infrastructure project it gives you access to both data storage you can think of this like a cloud storage like Google Drive or you know um, Dropbox or something like that it's very similar actually. And it also gives you access to high performance computers. In right now, the HPC we have access to is called Stampede 2. And on the right here, you see this top list, uh, top 500 list of HPCs. Uh, this is the list uh, for all the HPCs all over the world. And uh, you see here the Texas Advanced Computing Center, University of Texas, where also Design Safe is based. They have the Stampede 2 supercomputer ranked at number 18. We have another supercomputer. It's a newer one. It's called Frontier. It's ranked number five. So uh, these are some of the uh, you know fastest uh, supercomputers in the world, and it's very nice that Design Safe give you access to this uh, just by signing up, uh, as long as you're doing research in natural hazards engineering. So right now we have access to this one, the Stampede 2, but uh, very soon we might actually switch to Frontier, which is much faster. So that's actually a very good news. Uh, but I, I wanted to just emphasize that you, you guys really have access to this today if you want to run some of these uh, jobs on high performance computer. And we will see that it's as simple as just clicking a bunch of buttons. It's really that simple uh, with the same center tools. So this is actually how you start uh, some of these jobs on design safe and you know, we've seen this UI in the beginning with some push buttons at the bottom. So there is a run button to run run simulations on your local computer. And then there is run at design safe. This one will basically allow you to run the same simulation on design safe. When you click on this one, you see this dialog, you specify a job name, the number of nodes, the number of processor per nodes, and the maximum runtime. I just want to point out here is when you're using the that Stampede 2 supercomputer. The default co compute nodes we get access to, it's called KNL or night landing. These compute nodes, uh, they are actually very powerful. They have 64 processors, so a lot of processors, uh, but these processors are slower than most computers. So if you run like one model with very few samples, maybe it wouldn't 
uh, you know, speed up your simulation that much. I mean, if you look at this processor, it's 1.3 gigahertz. I mean, this is lower than most of our current computers. However, you have 64 of them. So you have many processors that you can run in parallel. So if you're gonna run many samples and you're gonna run a large model in parallel, then it's gonna be much, much faster than running on your local computer. You can run really large scale simulations. We've, we've actually ran regional uh, simulations for big cities, for San Francisco and for Anchorage and for Atlantic City on, on, on these supercomputers. And we've ran tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and even millions of buildings, millions of, of open seas models in, in, you know, kind of um, hours or a couple of days. So these are very powerful computers if you know how to take advantage of them the right way. Um, and the right way is to make sure things are scalable, they run in parallel. Um, another thing I want to point out here is you also get to specify the maximum runtime. And this is, n this is not trivial. I mean, this is important because, first of all, you can't use uh, compute nodes more than 48 hours because this is, this is a shared resource. A lot of researchers are doing simulations on these supercomputers. There are actually, recently we've started noticing we're getting lower priority and things might be slowing down for us a little bit because a lot of people are doing research for COVID-19, for instance. So it's a shared resource. A lot of researchers in many different fields are using these supercomputers. Um, so it, it cannot be, uh, it has to be less than 48 hours, but make sure it's not too, make sure it's not too short. Otherwise, your computation may not finish. I mean, if you ask for running a couple of nodes for a few minutes, maybe your your simulation takes 10 minutes or 20 minutes, so it's gonna time out and you're not gonna get the results. And also make sure it's not too long because if you request resources for a long time, for like a day or more, you might have to wait in a queue basically until you know you have a good priority to, to start running your job. So these are just things to keep in mind. So this is how you start jobs. It's as simple as that. You specify the number of nodes, the number of processors, the maximum runtime, and you click submit and it starts the job. And then you come back later, you click on get from design safe. You have a list of jobs that you had run before. I ran here a um, model with thousand samples and you just right click on it and you know you retrieve the results and visualize it. So it's as simple as that. That's how easy it is with the same center tools to run some of these large simulations. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens. I mean, EEQ is just a user interface. So we like to call it sometimes a front end, like many of the other Sim Center tools. And you provide some inputs and it allows you to generate some input files. So in that case, it generates an input file for the quota and the template folder that is compressed. And we call this the quota.in and template there to zip. And I'm mentioning these names because we will see some of this later when we do the demos. So this is all that you need to run the quota. This becomes the input for the quota. The, the quota is like the back end. It takes this template directory, copies it, makes many working directories, one directory for each sample. So if you have random variables, they get assigned different values in each directory and it runs the simulations and then kind of create a summary of all the samples in, a, in tabular form. And this is what we consume in EUQ at the end to visualize and generate the results. So this is how it runs. It's, there is a front end and a back end, basically, and there is interface between them using these files and folders. And now if we want to run this on DesignSafe, it's as simple as before we run, we just upload these files and folders to DesignSafe, to the data depot. And then after it runs there with the quota on the high performance computer, it hopefully runs much faster. We will download the working folder and the tabular output file and visualize them in EEUQ. So this is basically just a quick overview of how this works. And we'll see this when we're looking at running some jobs later, but I wanted to point out to you also is in addition to being able to access some information about these jobs that you run uh, using our tools like EEUQ, you can also access them from the design safe portal. So if you go to the workspace, you see a list of jobs and you can see, check the job status. You can access the folder where the job output is, which is in the data depot. So this is an example of a job I ran. And then you see like this dakota.in file, the output file, dakota tab without the tabular data. And if we scroll down in this folder, you will see all the template there, the work there's the stuff we were talking about in, um, a little bit um, in, in, in the last slide. 
Um, so I think that's it. So I think we'll spend like 30 minutes now uh, just giving you some overview. So I'm going to do some demos and we're going to see uh, this in action. So let me uh, switch from the presentation to the EUQ. So this is EUQ. You guys have uh, seen this yesterday. So um, and hopefully you ran through some of the exercises so you have it running and know how it works by now. But you start with the UQ tab where you specify the UQ engine, the method, uh, and uh, some of the parameters. So I'm going to stick for today's uh, demos with the quota forward propagation, flat and hypercube sampling. But there are different, definitely other methods. You can do sensitivity or reliability analysis. You can do also more efficient sampling methods, but I'm gonna stick with the Latin hypercube sampling for today. Uh, let's say I'm gonna run 100 samples, and uh, the general tab here, you can specify the location. We'll see this might become relevant uh, for some of the demos today, but I'll leave that for now, and I'm gonna specify the number of stories. I'm gonna choose MDOF, multi-degree freedom model, three stories and specify the floor weights as a variable called w once you do that uh, as long as the value here is not numeric it gets added to the list of random variables so now eeq understands that the weight of each floor in this multi-degree freedom model is a random variable we're gonna give it a mean value and a standard deviation and you can see the distribution here if you want this is how this random variable is distributed so we're assuming that the weight of each floor is kind of a random variable. It gets assigned different random uh, values as we run this. Uh, I think that's pretty much what I want. I mean, I went to the event tab here and I was gonna specify some inputs, but we can pretty much use the default. So I guess you ran something like this yesterday, but as I mentioned, this is the stochastic ground motion generation and just specify magnitude, distance, and um, VS30, the, shear wave velocity and there is another model here if you want that have more uh, parameters and it's more suitable for near fault motion but i'm going to stick with the simpler model Balachi Zotel, and uh, i'm going to run this hopefully this works in a few seconds so as this is running i'm going to show you guys something so in your documents folder under EEQ, you will find a local work there and a remote work there. So if you check this local work there, you'll find a temporary directory. And if you go inside this temporary, uh, temporary directory, you will see all the files we were talking about. We talked about the template directory. This is the template directory that is being used by Dakota. So EEQ actually generated this folder now with all the inputs. So if you go inside, you will see a bunch of input files. And um, and then it also generates, EEQ also generates this Dakota.in, which is the input file. If you actually open this file, you will see many of the stuff we specified. For instance, we specified that the sampling type is Latin hypercube sampling. So this is the value here. We specified that the number of samples is 100. We specified that we have one uh, random variable called W, which has mean 150 and standard deviation 5. So this is what EEQ help you do. It generates all these input files for you automatically. So you don't have to worry about all of this stuff. And then look at what happened. Now we ran, it ran the quota and all these working directory were generated, which are a copy of the original template directory, but with the random variable assigned different values. I'm gonna switch back to EEQ. It's finished running here. And once it finishes running, it shows you the results tab with all the EDPs that you have and the mean and standard deviation and so on. You can also go to this tab to uh, uh, create some plots of different uh, variables that you have. So there are, uh, you, you can switch between left clicking and right clicking to assign some of these variables to the X axis and Y axis. So if you have the same variable on X and Y axis, it will give you the histogram. So for instance, this is the histogram of the drift. And we have a small number of samples, but we'll see later that we can actually run this on uh, design safe with um, many more samples. So let me show you guys uh, one of these. 
So what I'm going to do, instead of clicking on run, I'm going to click run at design safe. It will ask me to log in. I will log in. I already have my username and password saved. Looks like it's, uh, <laughs> it's a little slow. Okay, let me try this again. I'm not sure if uh, something went wrong. I'm gonna restart this. I'll specify the same inputs again. So 100, three, step two, and the random variable is, and I'm gonna try to run a design safe. Anyways, I'm gonna wait for it a little bit here and see what happens. Uh, hopefully, it, so it, it actually logged in, but I think it's, uh, what it's trying to do, it's trying to create a directory and it looks like it's getting stuck. So it might be that there is some issue there. I don't know if, because I'm also presenting, it's kind of slow. Okay, I'm gonna try this a little bit, in a little bit, uh, let me try to log in one more time, no? Okay, I'm gonna try this again in a little bit. Uh, oh, it looks like it worked now, it was just slow. Okay, so let me try to run, it was just slow for whatever reason, it seems like it's an intermittent issue. So I'm gonna call this um, stochastic, and let's say we're gonna run 500 uh no i'm actually need to go back to uq i'm gonna change this to 500 samples and i'm gonna run this on the uh, design safe i will select 64 processors per node and four nodes so that's a lot of processors this is 256 processors and let's say we're gonna run this for i don't know uh 30 minutes hopefully it finishes before that so you can see the result. So I'm gonna submit this. And what it does, you will see it, it's creating a directory, it's uploading the Dakota.in, uploading template there. These are the files we're talking about that it needs to upload. And that's pretty much it. So this basically, it, it has submitted the jobs, the job now. And if you click on get from design, say if you get a list of jobs, this is the job that we just submitted. You can refresh the job, refresh the job status to see uh what's happening with the job now uh, so we'll let this run for a little bit if it's not done by the end of the presentation i have previous jobs that i can show you guys the results of running like a large number of samples uh, so now just for the sake of time i'm gonna switch back to the event i'm gonna start showing you guys how um, to uh, specify events uh, in different ways. So we've already talked about the stochastic ground motion. I'm gonna talk about record selection and scaling. So this is the peer NGA records um, uh, event tab. And uh, over here, as I mentioned earlier, it's very simple. You specify a target on the left-hand side, specify a record selection method uh, on the right-hand side, and you just click select records and that's it. So I'm gonna select records. This, this asks you to log in into the peer ground motion database. So you need to have an account with them. If you don't have one, you can sign up by clicking on this link. I'm gonna log in. So this logged into the peer ground motion database, did the record selection and scaling, and now it's trying to download the ground motions. Once it downloads the ground motions, it will actually show you what ground motion it selected. So now we were trying to select 16 ground motions here. 
So we have 16 records in this table and you can actually select any one of these and get it highlighted here in the plot if you want to see individual ones. Uh, but these are the records that were selected basically. Uh, you can also filter this by magnitude. For instance, uh, you guys can see here, um, let's see, most of these are actually more than 6.5, but let's say I want to select uh, 6.8 or more. I'm going to select these records, see what we, what's happened. So you see now all the records should have a magnitude of 6.8 or more. You can do the same thing with the distance from uh, uh, rupture and the VS30 of these records to filter them however you want. You can also change the number of records that you want to select. This is the first method. It's basically a design spectrum uh, specified here. Uh, using ACE 710, you just specify three parameters and it gives you this design spectrum, which is just this uh, different kind of uh, segments. There are other methods to specify this. So one other method I want to show you is the UIGS web services. So using that, you can uh, specify, use different standards, basically. It's a design spectrum also, but UIGS web services actually allow you to use different standards. So we you can specify ACE 716 or ACE 41, which is suitable for uh, retrofitting buildings. You can also use the International Building Code, uh, code or uh, any of these different standards. So I'm gonna use the ACE 716. You also get to choose the site class or the soil classification and the risk category. So you can change any of these parameters and you also need to give it the location. I put the location of Berkeley in here. You just click on select records. What it does in this case, it goes to the UIGS web service. It obtains the design spectrum from that web service. It feeds it into the peer ground motion database and do the record selection with that uh, new target spectrum, which came from UIGS web service. Now, someone asked yesterday, what if they are using a different code or um, they are in a different location, a different country? So, I mean, IBC actually covers some uh, other countries, not just the US. So it's possible that IBC can work for that. But also one thing I want to point out here is we have this user specified spectrum. So you can really uh, specify any spectrum you want. If you obtain the spectrum from another code, you can come here and specify it. For instance, I can add a, some different points here, or remove points if I want. I'm gonna just uh, create a spectrum let's say like this one and use it for selection. So again, it goes to the peer ground motion database. It selects records to match this target spectrum and comes back with the records that matches the spectrum that we just created, the custom one, the user specified one. One last thing I want to show here for record selection is the uniform hazard spectrum which also comes from USGS web service. It's called NSHMP or the National Seismic Hazard Mapping Program. <clears throat> it's a program in USGS that uh, uh, develops uh, seismic maps uh, for um, the whole nation, the whole US. So this is suitable to be used in anywhere in the US, whether you're in the West Coast or you are in the Central or East uh, US region. It actually works for both. And they have two editions. I'm using the latest one. <clears throat> you get to specify VS30. It's kind of like a soil classification, like it's a list of values that you have to choose from. This corresponds to like different site classes or soil classification. And the return period, which actually correspond to a probability of exceedance over a specific period of time. So this is, for instance, corresponds to, I think, um, I think 2% uh, in 50 years. So the, pr the probability of exceeding this target spectrum that we get from here or the uniform hazard spectrum will be 2% um, in 50 years. So we're gonna do this. This one uh, takes a little bit longer because this um, uniform hazard spectrum are based on doing PSHA. So it actually obtains many hazard curves for all the possible intensity measures at this location. There are many of them, there might be 10 of them or something. 
and then it, use, it interpolates each hazard curve to get the uniform hazard spectrum. So this is the one we obtained, and as you guys see again, using that target spectrum, we were able to do record selection and scaling. So if you have the older edition of this tool from yesterday, we only had that first one, ACE710. But if for today's exercises, you prefer to also use all these other features that we added in the last week or two, uh, I would recommend you get the release from today that was uploaded this morning. Um, it's a smaller file also, so hopefully it will be easier for you to download. So this covers the record selection and scaling features. I know we only have like 10 minutes or less, so I'm gonna go through the other ones a little bit faster. The next one is the site response. It will be covered tomorrow in a great detail, but you just specify, as I said, the list of layers. You can click on a button here. It runs the analysis for you for this soil column, and it obtains the ground motion at the top of the soil column. And you can use that to, to actually run uh, your building model. So right now, if we run the building model, we'll use the ground motions that is obtained by any one of these events. So if we run it like that right now, we'll use the ground motion at the top of the soil column. If we switch back to peer NGA records and we click on run, it would run it with this suite of records, basically. Uh, okay, so there are a couple of other ones I told you guys about. So I'm going to cover one of them quickly, which is the multiple peer events and this one just allow you to select a folder on your computer with peer ground motions and um, i'm going to select this folder and it just loads it like that it's as simple as that it loads all the records in that folder and you can start assigning them scale factors if you want and i think that's pretty much what i wanted to cover today we had already started a job here it looks like it has finished, so I'm gonna retrieve the results. So as I mentioned, when you run something remotely with a large number of samples, it uploads a bunch of files to design safe, it runs, runs it there. And then when you want to retrieve the results, it downloads the work there and the tabular output. And then you have this tabular output and you can start um, uh, analyzing your results. One more thing I wanted to cover. If you guys, uh, as I mentioned, there is a local work there here. So when you run an, an example, in the template there you have a lot of the inputs that you actually provided. So for instance, here, um, you will see the event file that you were using here, this evt.j. I'm gonna show you something. I'm gonna go back to event. I'm gonna switch to peer NGA. We had already downloaded a bunch of records here. Let's say we use the USGS web service. We run this. This is going to select a suite of ground motions. And I'm gonna run with this one. So now we're running with the selected records. I'm gonna go back to the local work there and show you what happens here. No, I didn't run. Hmm, sorry. Yeah, so this is the template directory we we're talking about. This is the template there. You guys see all these uh, 82 files. These are basically all the records from peer that we obtained. And you see there, uh, there are uh, 16 of them. So it actually, when it creates this template there, it obtains all the inputs and put it into that directory. So this is might be useful for you if you want to, uh, let's say, write your own scripts in, let's say, MATLAB or Python, and you want to present this data in a different way, let's say, for you're doing some research and you want to present it in a different way for your research, you might be able to obtain all the intermediate files from here. So just by going to the local work there, so under documents, EEQ, local work there, there is a temporary directory, and inside of that, all the working files are there, basically. The same applies for the output. So once this finishes, it will create this Dakota tab that out. So you actually have all these files there too. So if you want the input file or output files and you can write your own codes to, to do some analysis on these inputs or outputs uh, for your research too. So that's also one possibility. I made a mistake that I'm running 500 samples locally, so it's taking some time. But I think that concludes my presentation. I, 
Uh, sorry for taking too long. I want to really have a uh, few minutes for questions. Great, thank you, Well, uh, Well, do you have some um, exercises uh, for the participants to share? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're right. That way uh, those sorry. can be up and, and people can look yeah. at them before uh, we go into the questions and yeah. answers. Great. Yeah, the exercise is very, very simple. Uh, it's just basically uh, doing forward, forward or center tube propagation using either the models from part one or the, some of the models we provided for today. I put a portal frame model. So it's your choice. Even you can use the model of your choice. Uh, but we want to make sure that you are able to run all these different ways of characterizing the ground motion. So try to use record selection with a different target spectrum like ACA7, AC41 or uniform hazard spectrum, try to use the stochastic models or site response, and then try to compare these results and also attempt to run the simulations for 5,000 samples using four nodes um, on design safe. I think this one might take like half an hour or something if it works or hopefully design safe actually had a um, maintenance earlier this week and we were a little bit worried that it may not work well, but I mean, luckily it seems to be working. I mean, we had some hiccup today, but I think it works. <laughs> Might just be my internet was slower because I'm also sharing my screen and I'm presenting. So it's slower than I, it usually is. It's usually just you click on a button and it takes a few seconds and you start running it. So, so well, thank you so much. We have a couple of questions uh, from the attendees. Um, in the run, uh, run on design safe uh, window, uh, the question is, what are the number of nodes in that window? What is that value or that field? So, yeah, so as I mentioned, when you run this on, uh, when you do run on Design Safe, it's basically running on a supercomputer. It's a cluster of compute nodes. So a node is actually a computer, and it, it is supposed to be a powerful computer. I mean, it has 64 processors. And it's true that each one of these processors is a little bit not a little bit, it's kind of slower than our computers, but you have many of them. So number of nodes is the number of computers, basically. So when you say four, you're getting four different computers that are connected to each other. It's like a small cluster of computers. And that's what we call nodes. And node is a, a common terminology in cluster computing. They call each um, computer connected in a cluster a node. So it's like a computer. So you have four computers, each one has 64 processors. So you have a cluster that has a total of 256 processors. Uh, so that's a lot of compute power that we just requested. And we requested this for 30 minutes. I mean, you can do a lot of simulation with that. And you guys saw like a trend in a few minutes. And it, we were able to bring back 500 samples just by clicking a few buttons. Thank you. After filling in all the fields on the front end, can these uh, can these be saved and loaded back later? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks for asking this. I actually was uh, going to cover this, but I forgot. But you can save. So if you go to file here, you can save. You can do save as. And you can also load files. So in the examples folder for part two, if you uh, go to that folder, uh, it's already uploaded in, in, on Design Safe. If you go to that folder, you will actually find many JSON files here. You can load any of these. So if you load, if you cannot set up the UI on your own, you want to load uh, some of these, you can load peer events to show you the peer events or record selection with different methods. And you can load a stochastic event. And you can load the sim center events and all the input files are here. So these JSON files are what you can load uh, at the uh, examples directory. And these JSON events and peer events are just extra files that are used as the input, like the ground motions. So just try to load any of these or try to save it. And if you do save, it will actually um, ask you to save a JSON file too. So I actually sh showing the same folder where I was saving some of these examples for you guys. But if you have any difficulty running these uh, different events, these different models that we have saved, uh, definitely post it on the forum or uh, come to the office hours and ask us, and we'll definitely help you get it running. I mean, all of these ones should be running. 
both you can run them on your local computer, you can run them and design safe if you want to run a large number of samples. Uh, and yeah. Okay, and just uh, one last question. Um, one of the attendees has, has published a stochastic model for near field non pulse like ground motions, uh, and they're offering to incorporate that this into the program. So how Perfect. does he or she go about contributing their methods and I think um, I think the user forum is, is the correct answer that we'd like you to uh, log into the user forum and get get us get in touch uh, with us or with well uh, directly so that um, others can see um, the the process of contributing your your code um, and incorporate it into this tool so that the rest of the community can use it yeah that's perfect I mean this is exactly what we're looking for we're looking for the community to uh, ex extend these tools. We're not gonna uh, implement everything. We're really looking for researchers to contribute their models and having their models being used by others and cited. And it's kind of a win-win situation. It's, you know, other researchers can use this model and the person who developed the model can get uh, more recognition and more citations. And for us, it also allow us to help the research community. So that's really uh, perfect. So I think we're at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, well, thank you very much on, from, uh, from, on behalf of all of the attendees. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, to the attendees, thank you for your questions and for participating uh, in today's training on the EEUQ tool. Uh, we have another session tomorrow, uh, so please uh, join us for that. Uh, thank you very much, Well, and uh, participants. Thanks so much, Matt.